Welcome to the Jeff Knows Inc. Show with your host, Jeff Lopes, where we bring you the world's top athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, influencers, and their journeys to success. Hey everyone, I got to tell you about a product I've been using lately called Feedback Loop. If you're a project manager, an innovator, or even just a startup guy, whatever it is, like myself, you know it's always a struggle to make your next big idea a big hit. And let's be honest, 85% of new products always fail. And the huge reason why for failure is it's just too hard to validate that product, get a true fit with your customers. And if you're working with old style marketing research, you know it's too slow. Too complicated and way too expensive for a fast-moving team trying to build something great. But what if I were to tell you you could test all of your products and your product ideas to real targeted consumers whenever you want before you put all that money and time into new development? This is the main reason why startups and 500 fortune companies use Feedback Loop. They're looking for the feedback from their targeted customers early and as often as possible. Feedback Loop is hands down the best test before you invest product research platform on the market. You get to create your own tests in minutes and get feedback insights within hours of your exact target audience. And if you go now to go.feedbackloop.com forward slash Jeff, you'll get three full tests for free. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Three full tests for free. So if you want your next product to be a hit, make sure you test before you invest and launch with confidence with Feedback Loop. This podcast is brought to you by NordPass. I'm sure many of you, just like me, use your Facebook account to log into multiple websites or applications. But I bet what you don't know is many of these practices give hackers a free shot at all your accounts that are linked to your Facebook account. But I guarantee NordPass could help you avoid these costly situations. NordPass is an easy and simple password manager that is quickly becoming the essential cybersecurity tool. NordPass will keep all your passwords in one place and has zero knowledge of your password manager. You know what that means? No one else can see your inscripted vault, not even the NordPass team. One thing that makes me feel secure is NordPass was created by the same team who built NordVPN, the advanced online security and privacy app that's trusted by over 14 million users. You know this is as secure as it's going to get. And right now you get 50% off a two-year NordPass premium plan. All you have to go to is www.nordpass.com forward slash Jeff Knows or use the coupon code Jeff Knows upon checkout. And not only are you going to get your 50% off your first two years, but you're going to get an additional month free of NordPass and a 30-day free money-back guarantee. Again, that's www.nordpass.com forward slash J-E-F-F-K-N-O-W-S. Don't leave yourself vulnerable to hackers any longer and try NordPass today. Welcome to episode 177 of the Jeff Nozine Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lopes. Super excited to have on today Rob Lawless. Rob is on an incredible mission to meet 10,000 people. This journey started in 2015. What a great conversation. Sit back and enjoy. We are live. We are live on the Jeff Nozine Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lopes. Super excited to have on today Rob Lawless. What is up, brother? What's going on, man? Thank you for having me. Nice, nice to meet. Yeah, this is this is gonna be a fun conversation today. I know just a little rundown of how we met. I I, I followed uh, Rob through IG, and I kind of found out what he was doing. I, I don't even know how it popped up in my feed, and I was like, "This is pretty awesome." He, he's on a journey to meet ten thousand people and interview ten thousand people. Am I correct? Do you have a timeline on that? I do not, and I don't okay. consider it interviews either. I actually have a, an article that I send everyone. It's like PSA, okay. not interview yeah. people, because people so easily mistake it because I write about everyone after. Yeah, but yeah, I will. You understand where I'm coming from, because you know, like when people expect you to come with a set list of questions, they sit back. But if you're going to have a conversation, it's much more interactive. A hundred percent. And and that we talked about this prior to going on live today. I mean, anybody that's listened to my show knows that I I, I find curiosity uh, what drives a conversation i never have set questions i try not to research as little as i can about my guests and uh so this is going to be just I, I don't really know nothing about you besides that so where are you based out of tell me tell me what got you to start this this little venture of yours yeah so i'm right now calling in from uh, philadelphia pennsylvania so i live in the chinatown neighborhood of philly so i'm downtown yeah. i grew up 40 minutes outside of the city in the suburbs okay so yeah, I grew, grew up like a pretty traditional family. I'm the youngest of three. I have an older sister and older brother. All three of us went to Penn State University in central PA. 
And uh, my sister studied marketing. My brother studied finance. I studied finance. After school, I did consulting for Deloitte for a year and three months. And uh, then I did sales for a tech startup in Philly. And I'd minored in entrepreneurship at school. And I had all these really great friends from just being involved in everything from a uh, fundraiser for f- the fight against pediatric cancer to building houses with Habitat for Humanity. I was in a fraternity. I was a tour guide. I helped with our homecoming efforts. So I had like all these pockets of friends in college or yeah. university, as you guys would call it. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. <laughs> uh, I really like when I graduated, it felt like it was really hard to just continue to meet people organically. And in college, it was so easy. So I was like, how do I get around this? How do I get back to being able to create a sense of community and a sense of familiarity with the people around me? And how do I do that in a way that allows me to escape the corporate life path and turn it into a career? So I was like, I'm going to meet 10,000 different people. And I'm just going to see what comes of opening doors for no particular reason. I just want to meet people. I want to see where it goes. I'm just curious what happens when someone sets out on a mission like that. And I think tied into it as well, which I, I've learned was probably always there, but just in reflecting more back on my project, it's a desire to be a positive example of human connection. Cause I think we have a lot of negative examples of that. And I, I want to be a positive example. I want to encourage people to treat human connection as an experience rather than a transaction. Yeah. And I also, my big why is that I think every human interaction, no matter how brief has the potential to change your life. So I've seen that play out time and time again through my project, but a lot of, at this point, I'm 4,950 something people into this project. And people are always curious is, do you ever wish you would, would have stopped at 5,000 or do you ever get tired? And the, the answer is no, because I have that belief that every human interaction can change your life. So it's just, it's opening gifts every day. I, I love that. Let me jump in there quickly because there's something I say, and I've, I've said it a million times in my podcast. I'm not a very religious person, but I have a strong belief that every single person in your life has a purpose. And I say this all the time, whether you're having the shittiest day and you, and you see somebody at a grocery store and they give you a, they just smile at you and they change your outcome of that day, or you have somebody in your life for a month, two months, and then all of a sudden something happens where you guys separate. But that time they were in your life, there was a purpose for that. Whether it was good or bad, there's a purpose where you're taking a lesson from it. It changed your life in a positive way. You learn something from it. So I'm a strong believer. Everything you're saying is, is so impactful because Every single person you meet, you could take something from them. You're, you're constantly learning. I always say too, is the day you, the day you stop learning is the day you die, right? So it's so much that you can take out of what you're doing, which I love. Yeah, and learning is a huge piece of it too. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm so I'm into learning now. And I think the pace at which I learn is something I'm also interested in. Because once you stop school, right? It's really on you to 100%. go out and, and learn for yourself. And you can choose not to, you can choose to be stagnant or you can choose to grow. And I want to grow through learning about the people around me. And it's a quick way to, to learn about a lot of different things. I think back to the matrix, the movie, Yeah. But how convenient would it be if we could just download information into our mind, but we don't have the ability to do that. So the ways we can how, get that. How, how far are we from that? I don't know. I joked the other day. I was like, well, Elon's doing his whole Neuralink thing. So yeah, it's, 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 maybe it's, one it's a lot closer years. than I, like, I was funny because they were talking about it on the Joe Rogan podcast. And <laughs> I think we're, we're a lot closer than people think from that. We're probably the five, 10, 10 year mark where if you think of COVID and how that quickly sped up technology over the last two years and how many people interact with technology, whether it's your grandma or other on zoom or whatnot, if you think of people like Elon and, and, and the other individuals in that in that field are just speeding up that process i think we're a lot closer to that which is freaky could be amazing but could be very scary and just into your human interaction how is that going to change is that going to is that really going to start putting people more into the metaverse or whatever everybody's talking about which i'm not really into but there's so many different ways of looking at that right yeah would you get the chip no i i i i, I no no, I, there'd be I, a point, I, right? Like there, there will be a point. There, there will be a point, and I, and I, I think people are still going to be very, very reluctant to do it. And 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 man, it's, it's it's hard. It's hard. I mean, this picture you're standing there, and it's like we're not even having a conversation. I'm just pretty much reading what you're thinking. Like, how crazy is that? And how crazy is that? Is we're we're it, it will happen. I mean, knock on what I live for a few more years, it will happen in my lifetime. I do, do see that happening, which is pretty scary and pretty amazing at the same time. Right. Yeah, I agree. I, 
I think I don't think I would get it either. I enjoy the way that I experience the world as a human right now. Yeah. But that being said, if 90% of people had it and they're able to think so much more quickly and they're just much more productive, I'd probably be like, all right, I have to do this too. I I think it will be that too. I mean, you think of even like you move like a movie like Limitless or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. If you see that start processing with other people, how many people will will not even caring about how the longevity of it or how long will it last or what's the long-term effect? A lot of people will be jumping on it because they'll take it to advantage for financial gains or other gains, right? Yeah. Yeah. It just gives them like a, a one up on everyone. <laughs> That's crazy. I didn't think this conversation is going to go there. So we talk about speeding up your learning. What do you mean by that? <clears throat> I, I think just the, the pace at which I'm learning because say I was still doing consulting at Deloitte. I'm learning about maybe I'm in the consumer goods industry and I'm learning about like a certain company and I'm learning about the reports that I have to do and whatnot. But it, in, in my mind, I said with the corporate world, based on my internships and stuff, I think a lot of it can be repetitive. Yeah. So with the project, I'm just being exposed to so many distinct bits of information and experiences from people. So I'll go from a conversation talking to someone about their med school path and how they had to go through residency and fellowship and whatnot. And then I might talk with someone who's a chef and I'm talking about their path. I just talked to a girl who just went through a divorce. So I'm learning what that path was like and emotionally how that impacted her. And before that, I talked to a girl who lost her dad to COVID and I'm learning about what that experience was like. So Uh, None of these experiences are ones that I've had in my own life, but I get to step into their shoes for an hour at a time and and create that empathy and really start to like build up that library. And I told the girl, I was like, I I don't plan to ever have a divorce in my life, but neither did she. Right. So I'm gaining this experience of what it's like. And if I ever need it, I can pull that out in the, in the future. Same as talking to new parents they don't know what they're doing. Like no one gives them the guidebook. I'm not a parent. I don't know either, but I at least have that mindset going into it that, oh, okay, no one else really knows what they're doing. And that's actually one of the biggest thing I've learned from my project is that no one really knows what they're doing with their lives. Everyone's doing the best they can with the resources they have. I love that. And that's so true. It is so true. I mean, it, parenting is a perfect example of that. I mean, I mean, I, I, my, my son just turned 14, my daughter, um, and there's a story behind my son and the difficulties he had at birth, but my son just turned 14. My daughter just is about to turn 16 on son, Monday, 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 the ninth. And, um, when, when my daughter was born, I mean, uh, you, you didn't know what to expect. I stood there and be honest, the first year, and I think I'm an incredible father. I'm with my kids 24 seven. I'm my kids are 14, 16. I still drive them to school and pick them up almost every day. I'm always with them. I, I have very present time. I try to have dinner with them at least. I mean, lately we were doing construction on a, on a, on a project. So I'm, I'm, I'm two, two days a week. I'm not, but at least the other five days a week, I have dinner with them every single night. I make sure I'm home and be sure I'm present. I do their sports. I take them to their activities. So I be I try to be as present as I can as a father and um and 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 guide them and teach them as much as I can with my lessons. But in the first year of my daughter, man, I I thought I was ready. We me and my wife thought we were ready, and I stood there and I was like, I didn't know what to do. And in the first year, I was very unpresent. I just I I really dove into my business and and I've been an entrepreneur for twenty six years, and I and I use my business as an excuse not to be around because I didn't know how to handle it. Mm-hmm. So it, and and it and it took her to actually start like standing up and, and, and starting to say a couple of words and me started to interact with her before I started getting closer. And as she started walking and be able to communicate, I became closer and closer. So the first year was, it was hard. And my wife pretty much did, I would say 85, 90% of the work. So yeah, you, you're never ready. You, everybody deals with change differently. And I think that's what makes us amazing as humans. And I love what you're saying, because you can learn and be ready for an opportunity. It doesn't mean you're going to be hundred percent ready, but at least you'll know what to expect. So I, I love what you're doing. I think it's pretty, pretty awesome. Thank you. Yeah. It's been, <clears throat> I, I said, I'm not the same person today that I was six and a half years ago when I started this project. So I started this in November of 2015. It's been for, that long for background. Yeah. And then, so my path is I, I graduated Penn state 2013. Yeah did consulting for a year and three months. I left to go to this tech startup in Philly that had 24 million in funding. It was a data analytics company. I did sales for them, was planning to like ride the rocket ship to the moon type thing. Yeah. 
that did not happen. They, but in that time I started this project because I was still feeling that, that desire to get back to that community and to, to create my own path. Mm -hmm. And eight months after I started it, that company that I worked for was bought out. So I was laid off in end of June of 2016. And I decided to jump into this full time and I've not looked back. I've not worked for anyone else since July of 2016. So I've been an entrepreneur for six and a half years. Not, not, I admit someday I'll have my 26, but, um, I, it was funny because mine's even started younger. I, I, I always count from 19, but I first started my first company, a security company at 17. Mm. So I've been always, always on my own, which is, uh, something I'm proud of. And, and there's lots of ups and downs. I mean, don't, everybody thinks this is skyrocket up. There's, there's a lot of valleys, right? But I mean, there's, I always say with entrepreneurs, in the end of the day, if you can stack up more wins and losses, you're on the positive side. And that's the way you have to look at everything, right? And everything that's a loss is a learning experience. So you started in 2015. Yes. When did it start building momentum to like, to the, like, I, I, I mean, I'm watching you now and I see the momentum. Has this been going on for years? Has this been the last six, seven like months? Like when's the momentum been building up where you're starting to get obviously noticed? You're starting to, to see the following happening and grow at a rapid pace. When did it all start? Are you ready to unlock your full potential? I want to introduce you to the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast, a powerful resource to transform your life today. With expert interviews, practical tips, and inspiring stories, this podcast is your roadmap to lasting wellness. Here's what a listener has to say. I used to struggle with my health, but this podcast changed everything. It's like having a personal trainer, nutritionist, and life coach totally for free. With over 2,000 five-star reviews we're a podcast you can trust the fit healthy and happy podcast available now wherever you get your podcasts i would say 2018 2019 was okay. actually the fastest it was growing and i think because i don't know if you've seen this with instagram and whatnot but it, it i remember people telling me because i was keeping track of it on instagram a post with everyone that i met in a picture with them and everyone was like, once you hit 10,000 followers, it's just exponential. The accounts take off after there. That did not happen for it me. Does. No, it, it never happened. It slowed down. Um, but I had some cool instances along the way. So in, in, so I'm laid off from my job, 20, July, 2016. I go into this full time. I finish out my lease in Philly, which was 11 more months. And then I, I, wasn't going to do another lease because I knew I couldn't afford to rent and do this full time. So my Penn state roommate was like, Hey, if you want to come out to California, I have an extra bedroom in my apartment. You can just stay with me. I'll host you. So I went to LA for the summer of 2017 and I ended up going back for nine months in 2018. In 2017, I met this guy, Ryan, who ran this t-shirt company. And in 2018, when I had gone back, he was like, I want to introduce you to my friends. They run this YouTube channel called yes theory. And I think you have, a similar mindset to them. So you should talk to them. So I ended up meeting this guy, Matt, from this YouTube channel, Yes Theory. And they, I didn't know it at the time, but they have a massively loyal audience. They, Matt posted an Instagram story about me just being like, hey, I met this guy, he's doing this thing. And overnight, 2,000 people started following me. And then a month later, they, I was meeting a friend of theirs at their house. And one of the other guys posted me to their Yes Theory Instagram. And overnight, I had 4,000 people start following me. I got 400 messages from people all around the world. So it really took off in that time. And then later that summer, I was a guest on Ryan Seacrest's radio show. And in 2019... The how, how, how was the reaction with that? I mean, with uh, Ryan Seacrest. Like, did you get a big reaction without the radio? Or is radio still a very popular media for something like that? It didn't translate nearly as well. And I think yeah. the fact... It's because if you look at the path, like seeing someone's Instagram story with the handle and you just click follow Yeah. with the radio. It's like a two minute segment that comes on while you're driving on your way to work. You might think it's interesting, but then you have to go to work, remember the name of the handle. So yeah. I had like a bump of like 300 followers immediately from that segment, but that was yeah. it, okay. which is crazy because my expectation was like Ryan Seacrest yeah. biggest name. Like I'm never going to have to worry about press again after this. Yeah. And it was not that. Yeah. So but then the following year, the Kelly Clarkson show reached out to me. And Seriously, became, huh? Yeah, and I became a guest on her show, which was really cool. That is pretty uh, awesome. 
So it was like the week of, De- I think it was like December 9th. Cause I filmed that in August. And because I had met a bunch of people in LA, the entire audience was made up of people that I'd met. So that was really cool. But it was, it was Jane Lynch was another person guest on the show that day. It was me, Jane Lynch, Joe Coy. Yeah. And Jane Lynch was promoting a show that like was potentially getting canceled or pushed back. So they kept pushing the air date of our episode back. It ultimately aired December 9th. And that, that was a Monday and two days later, a segment that I had done with now this hit their Instagram page, which had like 2 million followers. So yeah. I had a huge jump, like 8,000 people started following me that week. And yeah, it kind of, that kind of big jump then. And ever since then, it's kind of like what, when you when down. you do that, do you try to? Is there anything you do to try to capitalize on that 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 moment? No, I okay. don't think so. I, I I'm not. I I think someone else could do my project and be much further along than me in terms of monetizing it, in terms of having people know about it and whatnot. But. I think the artist side of me is always like, you're just here for the experience. Like you're here to do it. And then the business side of me sometimes takes a, a second, a back seat to it. But then the business side kicks in. And it's like, Hey, you need to make money. You need to be able to do this. So um, yeah, I haven't really uh, tried to capitalize or, or anything like that. I will say now I'm approaching 5,000 people. I'll hit that in a couple of weeks. So I'm starting to reach back out to every media company that covered me in the past and trying to like get them to cover this again because it's a big milestone in the project but yeah and then so from 2019 until now the biggest jumps have been just tiktok videos that have gone i wouldn't say viral like they yeah, have yeah, yeah. 180,000 views or something like that but in each of those which is basically me just explaining the concept of my project i had like a thousand people message me each time it happened two, two times yeah, 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 yeah. It's just, it's, it's, it's so crazy the power of social media. But it's like you have that that little window. I find anytime you, even when if I have a, a massive guest on our podcast, we have that four to five day window to capitalize on that as much as we possibly can. I mean, we'll we'll have a guest on and in our a traditional like even this podcast, we'll still do nineteen posts after this, and um and and we really spread it through all the social media possible, but um. It's it, you have that very very small window to capitalize. If you don't capitalize in that small window, it's it's it feels like you've lost that that little inch of momentum you could get from that time, right? So, yeah, it's 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 it's. I love the artist side of it, but I do I I, I I'm as an entrepreneur, I'm like, how do you capitalize on it? Like, how do you make how are you gonna make money on it? Like, where where and you mind me asking, like financially, like how do you survive now? Like, I mean, you're not like, are you are you doing it through? Are, is it based on your YouTube channel right now? No, I don't even have a YouTube channel. I mean, I have the, the the name Rob's 10K Friends, but I don't, I've never, I posted like one video to YouTube. But the okay. way that I support myself now is public speaking. Okay. So, which I don't know if you're familiar with that industry at all, but if yeah, you Yeah, I am, I am, I am. I'm doing actually a gig in a, in a week or two. So I do a bit of that as well. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I'm really trying to, and I think that's one of the things that I've had to learn as an entrepreneur is you have like 10 different things you can put your time into, but you only yeah. have so much time. So which ones do you put it into? And in the beginning, I was like, well, I'm going to grow this project on Instagram and I'm going to, if people naturally take to it, then I'll be able to take on partnerships and whatnot. So I, I did that for a bit. I had companies here in Philly that would partner with me. It's like a dog walking company, a wedding photographer, an urgent care center, a dentist office, just yeah. because these people were part of my project and they wanted to see me continue. And then as I got, after Ryan Seacrest, I landed a partnership with WeWork, the co-working space. Yeah. So I had a nine month partnership with them that ended literally the Wednesday of the week that COVID shut the world down. So there was no re-upping that partnership, but I always figured that it would be driven through, yeah, like the audience size and the partnerships with brands. But then I learned how much money you could make through speaking from a girl that I met in 2019 her name is Michelle Poller. She runs a project called Hello Fears. And she's a fantastic speaker who at that time was charging $17,000 per speech. And I was like, oh, okay. If I'm <laughs> reaching out to a company to try and get a partnership for these posts or whatever, that's two grand, one grand, five grand, whatever. Or I can do a 90 minute speech for $17,000. Like I'm going to start reaching out to all these companies to speak there. So that's what I'm trying to do now. And um, I had like 15 paid gigs over the last year. I had my first paid gig in April of 2021. 
And since then, I, I signed to a speaking agent in the higher education space. I started speaking at conferences. So now I'll submit to conferences. I'll reach out to companies, basically reaching out to anyone who will bring me in to establish myself because I'm back at square one. Yeah. When I was with the project to meet people, I started reaching out to people being like, hey, will you be part of what I'm doing? And then the tide changed where everyone started reaching out to me. And then people were reaching out from across the world being like, this is so inspiring. So I'm just running the same playbook, but now with speaking where I will reach out to a bunch of companies, hopefully establish myself, and then hopefully the requests will start coming in. Are, are, you, are you speaking more on a leadership role? Like what, what, are, you, what, are, your, what are you focusing your, your, your talks on? For universities, it's, I call it how to talk to anyone. So basically how to have more confidence in getting to know your classmates, especially coming off the pandemic. And then for corporations and conferences, it tends to be in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space, specifically like inclusion and belonging. Yeah. And how, how do you kind of create that atmosphere? Because if you look at my network now, someone would have to fact check it, but I think I probably have one of the most largest, most diverse, if not the largest, most diverse network of anyone in the world. And I've just naturally gotten to this place and I've had so many great conversations with people. So side note, I used to meet everyone in person. I met 3,259 people in person. Wow. And that was like Philly. I lived in LA. I lived in Hoboken. I drove across the country six different times. So I hit like 20 cities in the US and then COVID happened. So I went virtual and if you remember from yesterday, I had like these 400 messages from all around the world. So a lot of those people started meeting with me and TikTok pushed it to different parts of the world. So I've met people from over 85 countries in the world now and people who have much different backgrounds and upbringings than me, but I always have really great conversations with them. And it's like, isn't that what the corporate world is looking for in yeah. their, their corporate environments and the atmospheres that they want to create for people where they feel seen and heard? So. I, I share my story. I share the three levels of value that I see in human connection, which yeah. is an increased sense of belonging, a shift in perspective, and the opening of doors for the future. And then I walk people through this framework to get to know each other, which it's Ford, Ford framework. It stands for family, occupation, recreation, dreams. And I'll give them questions for each category. And then I break them out into pairs to discuss with each other. And then I just talk about the importance of reflection. So it's become... I'm already starting to, for schools, orientation. A lot of schools are like, you'd be perfect for orientation. And then for corporations and conferences, every conference touts the networking capabilities of their conference. So I think I'm going to find myself being like an opening keynote speaker to really break the ice, get people comfortable with meeting each other so that they can make the most out of their time at those conferences. I love it. I love that. I love that you're finding a niche. How old, how old are you? 31. Oh, you look way younger, buddy. I thought you were going to say you're early to mid twenties. You look like a yeah, baby. Like, this still. is impressive. <laughs> That's pretty good, man. I got thirty one. Yeah, yeah. You're you're older than you. I thought you were. I thought you were in your twenties. I'm forty six. So uh, time, time, time does fly. I always say, Rob, there, there's a few things. There's three things with the educational system I, I I find wrong, and I talk about this quite a bit. And uh, the three areas that I find that they should be educational system be putting more emphasis on is public speaking networking and sales and those are essentially three things you're doing right now you're selling yourself you're you're doing public speaking and you're networking and and i think if this is something that was taught at a high school level and it was something that was an actual curriculum that was accounted for as part of the academics sector of it I mean, the kids who could be coming out of high school and going to university or going to being entrepreneurs at such a higher level. And it's something that I, I, I feel like our school system is so stuck in the old age where it's just, you have your allergy, you have all these things that I, my daughter comes home from high school. I'm like, and I, I don't remember, it's been so long since I've been in high school and my daughter comes home and I'm like, half these things you're never going to use in the real world. You're never going to use in the real world unless you're a scientist or some specific field. So we're, let's let's talk a little bit about that. We, coming out of the out of the educational system, and now that you're really trying to apply these three things into your real life, where's your mindset with that in the educational system? I agree with you. I think it needs much more of that. And actually, one of my long term goals, which is just a goal I've developed along the path of my journey, people are always like, "What do you want to do after you meet ten thousand people?" 
my goal right now or what I see myself doing is becoming a professor at a university and teaching a first year seminar where every class period students pair off one on one and they learn from each other's backgrounds as opposed to a textbook or a PowerPoint slide. And I think in that you're learning active listening, you're learning how to tell your story effectively. You're creating empathy for people who grew up in situations different than you. And you're also giving students the space to create relationships that could lead to friendships, romantic relationships, business partnerships. It blows my mind that schools are not already doing this. Obviously, I'm biased coming from what I do. But when I talk to people and I I learn how many adults are still socially anxious or how many people are still really nervous to get to know people or who haven't really stepped outside of their circle, it's like, why are we not doing this at a, a younger age? And I want to pull up a note if you will allow me to. Yeah, of course. I'm reading the seven habits of highly effective people right now. Okay. And there was a quote in it that stuck out to me. I think it's Henry David Thoreau or whatever his name is. But yeah. the quote is, for every thousand hacking at the leaves of evil, there is one striking at the root. I love and that. I think about that a lot for if you think about inclusion and belonging and whatnot, there's like, Oh, let's do this training or let's do this or this practice or whatever. And it's like, have you tried getting to know the people around you? Have you tried understanding the basics of their story? When you're talking about this and let's bring this back to something we talked about at the beginning here. When you look at things where our technology is taking us to like metaverse and all that stuff like that, you don't think it's, it, it, that's going to really put a, us a step back in the human interaction do I think it's going to put yeah. us a step back? Yeah. Maybe, but I don't know. I think that's looking at like the potential negative side of it. There could be potential positive where. Okay. Explain we, that to me. So say you're able to. My mindset up. is it mindset is if you find something that's really inverted to start with and they're already having issues interacting and meeting people in person, you want to get them out. Now there's another reason for them to falsely put themselves in this world and be something they're not so they don't have to get out in the real world they don't have to meet people that's my mindset with something like that Mm, i see yeah 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 i see what you're saying the the metaverse and whatnot yeah but i i have seen certain instances where they're like oh if you have a fear of snakes then you can go into this virtual reality and slowly expose yourself to snakes in virtual reality and you can kind of overcome that fear so that you are not afraid of it in the real world same with public speaking, like there are, I think, simulations that you can do to simulate the environment of speaking to an audience that that's bullshit. Then, that's, then bullshit. You, that's bullshit. That's bullshit. Honestly, no, I don't, I don't think that would work. There's nothing like standing. I mean, we talk about public speaking of all things, mm-hmm. which is probably something, if not the biggest fear most humans have is public speaking. And you're talking on a computer screen into individuals that don't see you, don't know you, don't even know who you are. You could be a, a total different character. And then you get yourself on a stage with 2,000 people staring you down. The world changes. Everything changes. You know that. When the first time you step on stage, it's, it's, it's a different world. And I think that's, that's my biggest thing. And it's crazy we're saying this. I actually do public speaking with my kids. Like I, I, I make my kids stand up and, and talk all the time or in front of people, mm-hmm. like really, really make them hear their voice or sound their voice out because I, I think it's such a powerful thing to do at a very young age to build that confidence, right? I think it's all around confidence and, and being fearless. And I think we, we live in a world where fear is something that's constantly pushed towards us constantly i mean i i I see this all the time too i mean you think of yourself as a kid how many times you would hear your mom or your friend's parents saying like don't touch that oven you're gonna burn your hands don't run those stairs you're gonna fall because you're people are constantly putting this fear in you as a child because you're not born you're born you don't have fear in you it's something that's taught to you and i think as we get older it's just constantly instead of us to my mindset is is putting yourself in uncomfortable situations on a regular basis so you break that those habits of fear and i think there are certain things where with social media stuff, it puts us behind and, and, and it kind of covers and, and allows us not to interact and push ourselves in, in that situation of putting ourselves in that moment of fear and, and learning how to live with it kind of thing. Does it make sense? Yeah, I see what you're saying. I still think it could help people. I, yeah. I, there's someone that I met was telling me about the ladder technique, where if you're really scared of something, you think about it as a ladder. So say your fear is getting to know new people, like you have incredible social anxiety. Yeah. And when you think about it, you think like, well, when I go to a party, 
I'm going to be really nervous to talk to people. I'm going to shut down. They're going to think I'm weird. I'm going to leave feeling crappy about myself. And it's like, well, if going to the party is the top of the ladder, what are the other nine rungs before that to get there? And what can you do kind of to step your way towards that ultimate goal? And maybe potentially one of them is a simulation of some sort. I will say <laughs> I practiced in front of my TV screen. I pulled up audiences on YouTube and I just sat and I gave my speech to those audiences because for me, it was like something that I could do. I'll just say, I felt like it was a step above not practicing in front of an audience at all. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. I love that. Yeah. I'm not going to say it's to solve the whole. No, no. And I say, I, I, you're, 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 I'm, I'm very open to everything. So I love that you said you did that and, and, and I'm sure it helped quite a bit. Right. Yeah. And the other thing is when it comes to the, I'm not certainly not defending the metaverse or anything like that. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, get to know people in person and, and enjoy the, the things that we have here as well i mean i'm sure someday i'll be like yeah virtual reality is really cool and you can do cool things in it but i do believe that those soft skills so there's and i think that's going to become even more important in the future if you go back to our conversation about why they should teach this in schools i had a conversation with one guy in my project and he said iq used to be the thing that everyone focused on because you know you want smart people but now that everyone has a supercomputer in their pocket it really doesn't matter. Yeah. If we have a question, we'll look it up on Google. So IQ is kind of even across the board now. So the next thing is emotional intelligence. People yeah. with EQ are going to be the people to make strides. And I, I do believe in that. Yeah, I totally believe in that too. I mean, it's, it's very, 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 very true. So timeline. So we started in 2015. Your 10,000 goal, do you have a, a rough date to where you want to be there? It, if you look at my initial emails to people, I said, I'm going to try to do this in aggressively about four years. So clearly I was wrong at how long it was going to take. But yeah. I now I think I'm, I'm 31 and I think it would be cool to finish by the time I'm 40 just because it's clean. But I also <laughs> don't like if I finish at 38, that's fine. If I finish at 43, that's fine, too. Yeah, I'm in this place and I think maybe you'll be able to understand it being an entrepreneur, but, and it's something I didn't understand until I was on this path myself, but like someone who's passionate about music, my thought was always, oh, you want to be famous. You want to play the Staples Center or whatever. But there are a lot of musicians out there who are like, well, I just really love playing music. And if I can survive off of playing music, whether that's in a bar or weddings or whatever, I'll be happy. Yeah. I'm now like that with my project where it's like, if I can just survive off of meeting people and sharing their stories and giving them a listening ear, I will be happy. And I feel like I can do that through speaking. So I'm not trying to rush through my project or to finish it, to then do something else. Like I'm not doing the 10 K friends project to write a book or to do a documentary. Those things might happen along yeah. the way with it, but I'm really just enjoying the, Pro the, the process. Yeah. So 40 only because I think it'd be cool to say by the time I was 40, I had met 10,000 people, but I'm not tied to that. So yeah, it took me essentially six and a half years to get halfway. So if you look at that, it should, I should be able to hit that within the next nine years. But the other part of the equation is as I get into speaking, the more I'm speaking, the less I'm meeting people, but it's a necessary part piece of the puzzle. Yeah. I mean, you're as an entrepreneur, you're going to go through different valleys. I mean, I've, I mean, I've had, I've been a gym owner. I've done every stuff. I, I'm an author. I wrote a book called Entrepreneurial Dad. I mean, I wrote two children's books. I mean, there's different paths and different stuff you do, right? So your attention, it's like different valleys, right? There's attention might for three months, four months, six months be to another adventure. doesn't mean you, you lose your passion. Like I've had come over for 16 years, right? You still have it. There is still my bread and butter, but I, I, I dabble a lot into real estate. I dabble into other stuff. So you're always constantly seeing opportunity as an entrepreneur. And what you're saying to me now in six months might change, right? You might have another adventure or something I was going to talk to you about. I mean, I, this is clearly a path for, and not, not saying you're going to do it, but I can see it clearly a path for whether a documentary or, or a book or something like that, right? So it, there's always different ventures. And as you start growing and you start doing more conferences and you start interacting, meaning more, people in the business field or business world, there may be other ventures or opportunities for investment or real estate or other stuff, right? Just, there's always different things that come about and you just, and you never know your path, right? When the opportunity comes, you, you, if you're, if it finds excitement in you, you jump on it, right? Absolutely. And I kind of view it as 
like each person I meet is almost like a Lego piece that looking back, I could be like, wow, I have all these pieces. What could I assemble with this? I could make a nice house or a car or this business. So I, I definitely think, and I learn so much again from people along the way that I might be exposed to something that I don't even know is a, as a path yet that I might want to pursue in the next five to 10 years. So I'm open to that evolution as well. And I, I think the initial idea was to meet 10,000 people in one year for 10 minutes at a time, like introduce myself. I thought it'd be a really cool concept. And then I kind of thought, okay, well, I'll meet everyone for an hour doing what makes them interesting. Okay. And I'm glad I didn't do that because there's so many people who don't think they're interesting in the world, but they are. But a lot of people carry that, that um, lack of confidence with them. Cause I get messages all the time of people being like, I'd love to meet, but I'm not interesting enough. And then we have a conversation and they're incredibly interesting, but it went from that to just, I found it was really easy to sit and connect and learn people's stories over coffee or over drinks. And when the focus was each other, it would really allowed us to uh, achieve like a deeper level of connection. Was this all, were these all video recorded or just audio recorded? Nothing was recorded up until COVID. Uh, Wow. Okay. Yeah. Everything that I write when I instill from when I meet people in person is just from memory. Okay. Do you have any regrets not recording at all? No, because I think it, if you think about the other person's experience, the way they're experiencing it, they get to just come and chat with someone who's the perfect stranger who is not part of their family. They can tell them things that they might not be able to tell other people. And they know I write about them afterwards. So I do have an Instagram post of what I learned from them, but I think I've gained the trust of people for them to be like, I know he's not going to write some stuff that I don't want being out there. Yeah. And then I, I did start recording with uh, COVID because when I had to do everything through Zoom, it was so seamless because our experience doesn't change, right? Since we're no. recording this, it's just a little button in the corner. But if I show up to you in person and I have a camera and I have a mic, it's going to change. And I'm sure you've seen it in yeah, guests. Like as soon as you hit the record switch, they go from really happy, personable to really shy, closed yeah. off. And yeah, I, for me, the important thing was the connection I was creating with that person. Cause I thought yeah. that would be more valuable than anything else that we could get out of the experience. Okay. Makes sense. Because I mean, I was, I, well, what, why I was focusing on that was because I, that, that was one thing I asked about the YouTube. Cause if you did have, obviously you don't had all these recordings. I mean, right now on YouTube, all those 5,000 videos, I mean, financially, you could be making decent money on YouTube as well with all these stories, right? So that was just a different avenue I was looking at. And I was, I was wondering why you didn't have your, you didn't start posting on YouTube, all these videos. Cause I was like, you have such incredible probably content and stories, right? Is yeah. there any stories? I'm mean, you're not going to say names that just, that just really stuck with you and you're just like really, really hit close to home or just brought in a memory or bought a smile on your face. Some a couple stories you want to share to us. Sure. I think the ones that always strike me are the ones that tend to be tragic because I, I was lucky to grow up with a non-traumatic upbringing and yeah. they, they just strike me in a way. Even the, the girl that I spoke to today who lost her dad to COVID to me is a reminder that I still have both my parents and to not take them for granted. But I have met people. I, there's a guy I talk about a lot, Chris. He was the 1300th person that I met. He, when he was 16, was on a, going boating on the Hudson River with his friends. And he fell off of the boat and got run over by it. And his legs got sucked up into the engines. So he described it as if they were put into a blender. And he sent me pictures years later. And you could see like where the blade had cut through his calf or where it cut through the top of his foot and all is all stitched up and everything. But he lost several liters of blood, was technically died on the way to the hospital, was brought back to life, given a 12% chance of walking and a 15% chance of living. And he beat both those odds. And I always say that that helped me frame a problem versus an inconvenience. Yeah. Yeah, I am always able to put things into perspective with my story, which you have to do time and time again, because it's easy to get caught up in the cycles of confidence and doubt. Yeah. But because I meet people so often, I'm being const- constantly checked. There was a girl who I just ad- admire her. She, If you talk to her, she's like, I don't want anyone's pity in any way, which I love about her. 
her name is Michaela. She was born with a condition called osteogenesis imperfecta. So she's lived her whole life in a wheelchair. I, I don't know how tall she is. She may be like three feet tall, but she's lived her whole life in a wheelchair, which to her is like, hey, this is my normal. This is how I'm experiencing the world. But when I met her, she had to, she was getting a, a surgery for scoliosis and they needed to stretch out her spine a little bit before the surgery to make sure it went better. Yeah. So, so for 12 weeks, she had a halo screwed into her head. So it was like this metal halo and the screws were literally screwed two place, two screws above each eyebrow into her skull. And then there was a little weight. So throughout the day, it was a subtle weight that would gently kind of like, she wouldn't notice the difference, but lift her head so that over time, her spine would get a little bit straighter before the surgery. But she had complications where the screws were coming out and they had to go and screw them back in when she was awake on the table. And she had posted and was documenting this journey about how it was the worst pain she'd ever felt in her life and how her screams were so loud and how she felt bad for the doctors that had to be there. And I was like, I don't think they're worried about how they are interpreting your, your screams. But another instance of where I just really admired someone's, I don't care who you are. If you have to get screws screwed into your skull while you're laying there awake on a table, you're probably not going to have a good day. And it's probably going to require a bit of strength. So I think about things like that as I've gone on my journey and figured out how can I do this and not live at my parents or not crash with my friends anymore. And this is tough. But I think about people like Michaela and Chris and I'm like, okay, it's tough, but it's doable. And I'd much rather be in this position. Yeah. There's always, I always say there's always as tough as a situation you feel like you're going through, there's always somebody that has a tougher situation or somebody has a stronger, st everybody, every, everybody has a story to make you cry when you think about it. Right. And it's incredible that certain individuals that you sit there and hear their stories and you just, you clench your teeth and, and it can't even really compensate the tragedy or the pain they've gone through. And to them, it's, it's, it was a part of their life. They're, they're okay with it. And it's, and it's like, I've, I've interviewed so incredible, incredible individuals and um, Zion Clark comes to mind. Um, he was born with no lower body and uh, he went on to um, become a collegiate wrestling champ. And he had the number one viewed short doc on, on, um, on Netflix for almost three years running. And it's something like that, that no lower body wrestling with full, I mean, quote unquote, normal athletes and beating them. So it's just, you, you hear these stories and, and this is a kid that went through so much from foster home to foster home to abusive situations, abusive situations with his disability and still always found a way to be positive at the end of it all, which is incredible, right? So hearing stories like that are just yeah, it's incredible. And then I, one thing you said there, and, and I wanted to touch base with Rob is um, you said the young lady that lost her dad uh, during COVID. I lost my dad, um, not due to COVID, but during the, during the pandemic, uh, Sunday is a year he's been passed. And, um, and it's, it still haunts me. It still bothers me. I was, I was, the, I mean, when he passed, I was a 45 year old that would, um, call and talk to my dad three days to three times a day still like i was very very close to my dad i'll call him on the way to work i'll call him usually before we go to bed i would have a conversation with him on the way home from work i usually call and talk to him or my mom and 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 it was a sudden heart attack unexpected didn't smoke didn't drink power walked every day and had a sudden heart attack and died and and part of the way i lived before i i always focus on living with no regrets and, I, and I've done that because of my son, a little bit about myself. Like my son was, uh, I'll be a quick little rundown. My son was, um, when he was born, he spent the first four months of his life at a at sick kids hospital, which is, we're very lucky in, in Toronto, Canada. We are one of the best pediatric hospitals in the world. And he spent uh, four months of his life there. And uh, when he was um, discharged, he was given a diagnosis of uh, CP, several palsy, and said he would be confined to a wheelchair pretty much his whole life. And, and I took it upon myself to uh, do everything I can in my power and put him in the best opportunity with physio, with exercise, with working out, with stretching, with everything to, to kind of change his path. And um, he went from possible wheelchair to AFO braces. He was wearing full braces to his knees. 
And uh, we made a, a goal before his 13th birthday, he was going to run a marathon. And by his 12th birthday, he was out of his braces. By his 13th birthday, we ran a marathon together. And this kid's my workout partner. If you see my folks, he's my workout partner. We work out together. We completely changed his path. And, and doctors are just astounded by his results. And, and, and I had started living with that no regrets from that age. From the day he was born, the day we came home, I had that mindset where I was going to do everything I possibly can. And even though I lived like that and I still saw my dad all the time, he's, my dad was always with my grandkids, you still had regrets. There's still so many things I wish I was one and still do with my parents. So you having your parents around still appreciate that, right? It's, 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 there, is, there will be a time when they won't be around and there's a lot of things you're going to wish you could have done. So um, yeah, living with no regrets. And it's funny because I have a speech they said a couple of weeks and, and actually the, the topic I'm going to be talking about is living with no regrets. Because I think it's such a powerful thing because a lot of people just go by their day-to-day lives and they and they totally forget to make that phone call or they hold a grudge. And then when they realize that grudge, something happens and they wish they didn't, they picked up the phone, they called the loved one, they called the friend. So living with no regrets is something I'm very passionate about and it's something I think a lot of people, more people need to really, really start focusing on because it just makes life so much better. Yeah, I love that message. And I, I try to do the same thing in my life. and. When I lived with my parents, which is, I went back to them when I was 27. And then, so right, right after I came back from LA the first time, I moved back in for five months. Then I came back the second time, moved in for four months. Then I came back for two months. Then I came back from COVID for a year and a half or whatever it was. And I would always give both, like my mom and my dad, like I'd give both of them a hug before I'd go up to bed and I'd tell them I love them. Yeah. And th- there were some times where I was like, oh, I'm already upstairs. I should just go to bed. And I was like, well, if something happened tonight and I woke up tomorrow, how would I feel if something happened to them? Yeah. And I would get it. I'd make an excuse to go back down, I'd give them a hug, tell them I love them yeah. and then go to bed. And that's a direct result of me meeting so many other people who don't have the opportunity to do that anymore. Yeah. yeah. And uh, my whole project is kind of driven by that mindset too. There was a guy, even before I started my project who I met with, he was a successful venture capitalist. And I I bugged him because I was trying to network and I just wanted to, he he eventually ended up letting me have lunch with him one day. And he said, you really have to think about like when you're 90 years old on your deathbed and think about what you want to have looked back on and accomplished in your lifetime. You have to think about yourself on your deathbed and think back on what you want to have accomplished. So when I think about my, me 90 years old on my deathbed, I'm like, wow, should I have stayed at Deloitte and worked my way up to partner? Or would I be happier that I went out and met all these different people around the world and got a sense of what everyone else's life was like? And every time it made it really easy to stay on this course. So I live with that mindset as well. Yeah, it's funny you said that because that's actually, I don't have no set questions when when I'm running a podcast, but one of the only questions I ask at the end is, if something were to happen today, how would you want to be remembered or thought of uh, by your loved ones, your friends, if something were to happen to you. So it's, it's, you essentially answered it there. It's, it's hard when you, when you sit back, cause I mean, we're all busy with our lives and our schedules. And I love that you said that, that, that you would make sure you come down and give your parents a hug and a kiss and something where something simple like that is so meaningful. And I think we get so busy with our schedules, our lives, especially me. I got, I got two active kids. I'm, they're always in sports. I got, I'm, I've been married for, going on to we're just past 19 years so i mean time flies right and and i feel like i'm still in my 20s like i'm still active i still work out i still take care of myself i feel like i'm in my 20s mentally but um i mean physically it's um i mean physically i feel still in decent shape but it means it's it's that mindset where time does fly and i look at myself and i'm like i'm, I'm a couple of years away from 50 men and it, from here on like how much time is left i just i just recently um two weeks ago a uh, week and a half ago, um, and, and I'm still shocked by it. Uh, my 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 wife and my uh, my kids. We went on a trip to Jamaica ten years ago, and when I go on like hospital vacations, we usually go once a year. I, I it's my time. Like it's my time away from the office. My time away from everything. I just pick up a book. I love reading. I love just spending time, quiet time. So I usually don't interact with other people on the, on on the resort. And for some reason, ten years ago, we met this other couple, and our kids started playing together, and we ended up for some reason hanging out with them the whole time. And incredible individual. And when we got back, I actually learned a little bit more about him because we ended up getting each other's numbers and meeting up on social media. 
And he was actually a NASCAR driver at the time, open wheel NASCAR driver out of uh, New York. And, um, and uh, it came from a very wealthy family in New York, uh, excavation company. They probably run the biggest excavation company out of New York. And we just became friends and it got to the point where we were talk all the time. We became friends. Uh, we, my, as a family went to New York on a trip, we ended up staying with them, bit like passing by, visiting them and that stuff. And I just got a call, I got a call. I got, I seen a message um, uh, a week, week and a half ago uh, from his wife uh, that he suddenly passed away with a, but I found out after he passed away with a heart attack, Jay had just turned 48 and, it's, and he left a four, eight and 13 year old behind. So it just shows how, how unpredictable life could be. Right. I mean, that was obviously not in his cars that day when he got out, when we got up, had his coffee and went to work. So it's, it, you have to live life to the fullest. You got to live with no regrets and you got to, a lot of people talk about just uh, living life to the max. And, and to my mindset is, is, I mean, I, you hear it all the time. And, and I was, I was, I was talking about this the other day as well is when I look at my kids and many times I pull my kids out of school and I'll go do something with them. I'll take them to a baseball game. I'll take them out. I'll take my daughter shopping. They're not going to remember what they did in school 10, 30, 10, 15, 20 years from. They're going to remember that day I took them out of school and I spent the day shopping with them. I took my son to a batting cage. Those are the things they're going to remember. Those vacations we took when I pulled them out and did stuff with them. So as a parent, you have to build those memories and you've got to be present with them. So those are things I'm very passionate about teaching. And I, and I work with a lot of father entrepreneurs and I'm trying to always teach that because you got to fill the memory bank from a very young age because you don't know how we, we are all here on a, on this little path. We don't know how long our path's going to be kind of thing. Right. Yeah. And that's another thing that I live by is I, I think on a personal level, the goal, of course, there's leaving a legacy, having an impact on people around you, but for that personal fulfillment, I think it's the person who has the most positive memories at the end of the day is the person who wins. And yeah. again, another thing that drives me with this project, because instead of running the same report every week, every month, every day is new. And I have, I have unique memories from every single day. And I can look back on my Instagram now, and it's like a visual journal of where I was, what I was doing, who I was talking to, what we were talking about. And I'm like, oh, it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool yeah. to have that vault of memories. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing when you think about that that way. And you're in your, and it's still, I mean, the, the path is still, you're only halfway there, which is pretty cool when you think about it. Yeah. And that's, I, I think I will continue to meet people after I hit 10,000. I won't go, I don't think I'll set another big goal or anything like that, yeah. but I think I will continue to incorporate intentional connection in my life because it's just a way to continue doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Which is pretty amazing. Is there, yeah. any, is there anything you want to leave with our audience? I want to ask you one question before yeah. I let you go, which is my favorite question to ask people. And I think it's a really great question to get to know people and to show them that you deeply care about them. But the question is, if you think about your identity as a pie chart, yeah. what are the categories that make up who you are and what are the percentages? Because you told me you do a bunch of different things. You're an author, entrepreneur, father, like all these different things. But if you think about it as a pie chart, what are those categories and what are the percentages? Uh, I mean, 45% family, 15% everything else. I would say yeah, that's pretty, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate about being an entrepreneur, but I realize it's, it's just a facet to financial gain and financial freedom. And I use that as a tool or a vehicle for my family, right? The financial freedom to me is, is everything. When I, when my son, I didn't know his future. I didn't know what was going to happen with his future. Um, part of his, uh, a big chunk of his brain was um, damaged at birth. Uh, six organs were severely damaged. He was the smallest kid at six kids history to be on dialysis at two and a half pounds. And I didn't know his future. I didn't know he was going to turn around stuff like that. So from a young age, that, that would actually spawn me into real estate. And, and I started really investing in real estate because I wanted, if something were to happen to me, they would have fixed assets. They would be financially, um, my kids would not only have an asset, they would have a steady passive income from the rent. So they would be financially taken care of. So a lot of, a lot of things um, turn in that moment. So I, I look at business as, as a vehicle for financial freedom to allow me to do the things I love every single day, which is 
be as much time around my family and build as many memories around my kids as possible. So I think fatherhood is number one. And obviously I'm, I'm very lucky that I have um, a very independent, loving mom to my children. My wife's incredible and um, my best friend. And it's, it's uh, family's everything, man. If family's everything. And at the end of the day, if that's, 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 that's the purpose of getting up every day. So my son, like, God, T, I, 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 I brings tears to my eyes. I'm like, he just puts a smile on my face. Every time I see him, it just puts a, my kids just put a smile on my face. I'm always so proud of what they do and what they accomplish. And, and I'm very lucky that they've, they've really driven to follow in my path with even anything like fitness wise. I mean, my kids don't fight over a video game. They fight over who can use the treadmill at home. They both were workout fanatics. Um, they're both driven to, especially my daughter, she's a natural entrepreneur. She's very driven to be an entrepreneur. So yeah, I, I would say 45% towards my kids and my wife and, and, and obviously my mom and family. And, and then the rest is just vehicles to everything else. And obviously those vehicles, I want to be at the highest levels I possibly can with the podcast, with my books, I, my book became number one seller in 11 categories. I mean, everything I do is I try to maximize, but like I said, remember we talked before, there's, there's little valleys, little, little metals I'm going through. Those are just little sections with all of them have an end goal, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, so I would say 45, 15, everything else I, I shove into that little 15. Nice. I like it. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. This has been awesome, brother. I, I'm excited to continue our conversation, just to get to know each other even more on a, on a, away from the camera. Cause I think, uh, there's a lot of things I could probably help you with. And I'm sure there's a lot of things that you guys could probably learn from you as well. Uh, and, uh, this has been awesome, man. And uh, where can our audience get a hold of you? They can find me on Instagram at Rob's 10 K friends. So it's R O B S one zero K friends. That's where I post a picture with everyone that I've met and their stories. I also post some behind the scenes things to TikTok. same handle Rob's 10 K friends. Um, my website is Rob's 10 K friends.com. And if anyone is interested in speaking or anything like that, either hit me up on Instagram or email Rob's 10 K friends at gmail.com. And if they want to be a part of the project, hit me up on Instagram. That's the fastest way to get in touch. How, how many, how, before you go, how many messages do you get on a daily basis through IG? It really depends. Some days I'll get like one or Seriously, zero. Yeah. yeah. Other days I'll get a thousand. It depends on what is, is going on at the time. I would say right now I probably have at least over a thousand unread messages that I have to get back to. But what happens is people will get excited in the moment they hear about it through Kelly Clarkson or now this, they reach out. I don't get back to them in time. They stop following along with the project. They forget that they ever reached out. Sometimes I'll reach back out to them and they're like, who are you? <laughs> and I say, you messaged me. So I think it's just, it really depends. It, it, the ebbs and flows of who's talking about the project and who's covering it uh, and who I meet too. Cause a lot of people, find out about it through word of mouth. But you, yeah, I guess a couple a day because every time I meet someone, they're always telling someone else that they're going to do it or what they did that day. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I love it. Very, very cool, man. I appreciate this. This has been a fun conversation. And uh, yeah, I'd like to continue with it, buddy. Thank you very much, buddy. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate you. That's a wrap for today. I want to thank our guest, Raw, for taking time as busy schedule to be a guest on the Jeff Nozine Podcast. Like always, guys, if you enjoy this as much as I have, tell your friends, tell your family, help spread the word. We're trying to build something special here. Leave a review. Myself, my staff, we love reading the reviews. Five stars will be absolutely amazing. Until next week, guys, keep moving forward.